Last Sunday morning, I preached to you on the topic, living in view of the cross. I pointed out how in years past I had heard men pray that as we listen to a sermon that we ought to listen in view of the cross and that similarly we ought to be able to pray and we ought to understand that as we live as Christians that we ought to live in view of the cross because as you listen to a sermon if you listen with your mind upon the cross it will affect how you listen to that sermon and if as you live from day to day you keep your mind on the cross I think it will affect how you live if you understand the reality of the cross the reason for the cross and the result of the cross then that will affect how you relate to this world the New Testament is replete with teaching about how we are to live while we're here on earth the teachings of the New Testament regarding the Christian's relationship to the world apply to older folks the teachings of the New Testament regarding our relationship to the world applies as well to the younger people it doesn't matter your age if you wear the name of Christ if you propose to be a Christian a disciple of Christ then you are accountable to God for what you do in this world and he has a definite will for you and one of the parts of that will has to do with your relationship or your interaction with the world and the evil that is in this world and in the passage of scripture that Johnny read for us a while ago and the Hebrew writer in the 12th chapter said one of the things that we need to do while we live on earth is to keep our eyes upon Jesus the author that is the beginner and the finisher of our faith and understand what he did while he was on earth he came to this earth but he did not allow himself to be distracted from his mission his mission was to serve God his mission was to die upon the cross as a sacrifice for our sins and he never let anything distract him from that he never let anything get him off course and we would do well to keep him before us as an example in that dedication and commitment but then he mentioned something else in that Hebrew letter as we make this way through this earth it's possible for something to weight us down something to drag us down and make it hard for us to walk as Christians it's called sin and there are sins that are like weights and they beset us and they, they hinder us, they get in our way. Things of this world that God with his infinite wisdom knew would not be in your best interest as a child of God whether you're 15 or 115. God knew that there were things in this world that you didn't need to participate in or do because it would keep you from living the Christian life. It would keep you from doing his will while you're here on earth. And so he said in that Hebrew letter, let us lay aside the weight of the sins which so easily beset us and run with patience, that is endurance, the race that is set before us. That tells us and then reminds us what we're all about as Christians and that our Christian life is not just here in this auditorium on a Sunday morning at, at 11 o'clock. Our Christian life is out away from this building as well. And it's in the office. It's in the workplace, wherever that is. Whether it be an office, a factory, out in the field, in the car, on the telephone, wherever you are. And with whomever you are spending your time. Your Christian life never ends. You are representing Christ everywhere you go. And God has a will for you as you are in here. And we follow that will. But he has a will for you when you're out away from this building. When you are elsewhere. Whether you're alone with one person or a thousand and one people. 
God has a will for you as you walk as a Christian. Let's study some of it this morning. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. To the New Testament for Romans chapter 6. And if you didn't bring your Bible with you, look in the songbook racks. There you will find some Bibles available for you to read from. And I think that you'll get more out of it if you read with me as well as just listen to it. Romans chapter 6 is a chapter that deals specifically with the kind of life that God expects, the kind of life that God demands of you as a Christian. If you're going to walk this Christian life, if you're going to live as a Christian and wear the name of Christ, here are some things to understand. Now read with me, and I'll interject comments along the way. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I pause there simply to explain to you that it is obvious that there were some people in the church at Rome who had a misconception of the grace of God. From the context of this entire letter, particularly this, this section of Romans, it is apparent that some of them had concluded that because their sins were covered by the grace of God, and the grace of God is the means by which we're saved, therefore, if they sinned and that brought the grace, maybe they should sin more in order to activate the grace of God more. Now, maybe to you that doesn't make sense. But to them in that setting, it did. So Paul said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Certainly not, in other words. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our, watch this phrase, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin or be slaves to sin. Now the comparison that the Apostle Paul drew here still applies to us today. When a person comes saying, I want to be baptized into Christ, I want to be a Christian, I want forgiveness of my sins, that person has made a decision. That person has said, I no longer want to do the things that are evil. I now want to do the things that are right. I want to do the things that are holy, the things that are the will of God. So they've made a decision. And that decision involves a death, a death to the practice of sin. But what do you do about all those sins that you've already committed? You wash those away by the blood of Christ. And that washing takes place by the Lord when one is immersed in water. Now the water is not holy, the water is not different from the water in your house, but it's the action that you're taking by faith in God that makes it a very special moment. And it is when you are immersed in that water and that action, that symbolism of cleansing in water is the moment when God by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, washes away every sin you've committed. So that takes care of that old man. That old man is now dead. He's crucified. That's what this, this passage of Scripture says. Verse 6, that the old man is crucified with Christ. That, see that next word? That the body of sin might be destroyed. That, henceforth, that is, from this point forward, we do not serve sin. We don't do the things that are sinful anymore. And we understand that when we become Christians. Look back up at verse 4. The last phrase in verse 4 says that we walk in newness of life. 
There's a different kind of life that is expected when one becomes a Christian. May I have the attention for just a moment of everybody in this audience who's not a Christian yet? May I have your attention and let you know for a fact and very clearly and simply that you need to understand that when you do become a Christian, when you make that decision to become a Christian and you are baptized and all of your sins that you've already committed are washed away, that there is also that decision from, that, from, from this point forward, your life will be different. And if you've been telling lies, you quit telling lies. If you've been stealing, you quit stealing. If you've been living in adultery, you get out of adultery. If you've been committing fornication, getting drunk and so on, you quit those things. You leave them behind because they're things that the Bible clearly teaches are sinful. And you don't do those things anymore. Well, that obviously leads to the conclusion it's just an obvious conclusion that if one is not ready to make that decision and that change then one is not ready to be a Christian don't wear that name Christ don't say I'm a Christian don't pretend like you'll be a hypocrite if you pretend it and you're not so you make that decision, I'm ready to put these things behind me, and if I'm not ready to put these things behind me, then I'm not ready to serve the Lord. Now that doesn't mean that you have to be a sinless person, a perfect person from that point forward in your life, because none of us are able to achieve that. That's why we're not under the law of Moses, that law of works that could be kept only by perfection. But we're under the law of Christ, the law of mercy. And so when we do sin, not intending to, not desiring to, but when we sin, when we choose to do that, which is evil for the moment, but it's not a habit or practice in our lives, we can have forgiveness of that. And we get that forgiveness by asking the Lord to forgive us. So his mercy is extended to us. And thank the Lord that we don't have to be sinless and perfect and flawless in order to be Christians. So you don't have to do that. But there is this difference. Your mind changes. Because when you're not a Christian, there's nothing to keep you from telling a lie, getting drunk, slapping another person just to be mean about it. There's nothing to keep you from doing any evil that you can think of. There is no reason for you to refrain from doing it unless it's something that's against the laws of the land and you're afraid of getting in trouble with the laws of the, uh, the, laws of the government and the officials of the government. There's nothing to restrain you whatsoever. But when you become a Christian, your mind changes. You have a different mindset, a different approach to life, and you're now wanting to serve Christ, serve God, please God and so God says you no longer serve sin you're no longer a slave to sin you now choose to serve the Lord which means putting the sins away and you reach a point where you would say are you listening you reach a point where you would you could and you would say I can't think of a sin that I want to commit I have no desire to sin. Now that doesn't mean I want, because see, I'm still human and I'm weak. But I'll tell you this, if I, in my humanity, in my weakness, if I do choose to yield to some temptation, the instant I realize I've done it, I'll be so sorry for it that I will beg my God to forgive me. And he will. That's what sets the Christian apart from the world. The person in the world may feel no remorse, certainly no godly remorse, but the child of God, the true disciple of Christ, cannot sin without feeling spiritual remorse. If you love the Lord and care about him and want to serve him and praise him, your only interest 
is being righteous and doing what is right. But let's read on. Looking at verse 6 again, you see the words in the King James Version, the word serve sin, that henceforth we should not serve sin. It's a good clue now as to what's coming up. Read on verse 7. For he that is dead, that is, he's died to the practice of sin, he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, verse 11 now, likewise reckon. The word reckon there has the, the carries the idea, the, that is the Greek word from which it's translated, carries the idea of accounting, like in math, in the business world, accounting. Put this down, mark this down, make this note, in other words, that's what he's saying, that you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In that light, I can say that every person in this audience right now is both dead and alive. I could even, in, by giving a modification, could include the babies, but I won't. I'll just say that all of us who are old enough to be responsible for our behavior, who are old enough or mature enough, and emotionally and mentally developed enough to be responsible for our behavior, we're all dead and alive. You're either dead to Christ and alive in sin, or you are dead to sin and alive in Christ at the same time, one or the other. Now, here's a key point. And young people, listen to this. Mamas and daddies, listen to this. Senior citizens, listen to this. The key point is this, that it's not just what you say that'll cast the vote. But whether you're alive in Christ and dead to sin or alive in sin and dead to Christ is not determined by what you claim. It's in your actions. It's what you do. And you're going to see that in just a moment by the text. Now read on with me. Verse 11 again. Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not. Now this is an imperative. This is a command from God. Young people, this doesn't come from mom and daddy. What I'm giving to you here doesn't come from the mama, the daddy, the preacher, the elder, or anybody else. This is from God before whom you're going to stand in judgment. Let not sin therefore reign, that is, have control in your mortal body. Mom and daddy, that applies to you too, of course. And it applies to the preacher and the elders and everybody else. Let not sin have control in your mortal... Ooh, wait a minute. I see something that's not stated there. Do you know I read what's there? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, but there's something that's not stated that I see, and it's this. Control. I have control over that. I have control in this situation. I have a choice to make. There's a decision, and it's all within my power. I will either choose to let sin, let sin, yeah, I will choose to let sin have control in my life, or I will choose not to let sin have control in my life. That's a choice. It's my power. Doesn't matter what people around me are doing. Doesn't matter what people try to get me to do, what people tempt me to do, what Satan tempts me to do. Satan cannot make me sin. I will choose to sin. You cannot make me sin. I will choose to sin. And there's nobody in your world today that can make you sin. You choose to sin. Now people can tempt you. And Satan can tempt you. But God has said, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. You have control over him. So you don't have to curse. You don't have to drink the beer. You don't have to go watch that nasty movie. 
You choose to do those things. We have a choice in it. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now in verse 13, there's a five-letter word that is used twice that you really need to focus your eyes and your mind upon. And it's Y-I-E-L-D, yield. Now the yielding that is called for in that verse is not totally parallel to what you find at an intersection, you know, when you come to one of those roads that's merging into another. And as you merge into that other traffic, there's that triangular sign there in front of you that says, yield. Now that says, <laughs> let's tell it like it is, that says whether you want to or not, or whether you think you're in a bigger hurry than that other driver is or not, you've got to let him go first. May not be your choice, but that's what that means. That's not this. This yielding is of a voluntary nature because this comes from the will or the mind and this says God has a will Satan has a will God's will is for me to do what is righteous Satan's will is for me to do what is evil Satan would, he can't because God won't let him, but Satan would overpower me and make me do evil. God could overpower me, but he won't and make me do righteous. God leaves me as a free moral agent in the middle. And so I, once again, I say, have the choice, the power, and I will either choose to do the will of Satan or I will choose to do the will of God. The word yield in verse 13 says that my choice is no longer to yield my will, submit my will under the will of Satan. But now I will find his will repulsive and I don't have any desire to do that which is sinful, that which is of the world. But I now yield myself to the will of God. And if you're where you can, look at me. See what I'm holding up? My hands. That's included in that word that is in verse 13, instruments. Once these instruments were yielded as instruments, what Satan could use to do evil. He could get me to use my hand, use my eyes, use my mind, use my, my speech. In a lot of ways, he could use the instruments, the parts of my body to do evil. But I will now take those same instruments and yield them unto God as instruments of righteousness. And the same hand that can be used to do harm can now be used to heal with a different touch. The same tongue that could be used to speak profanity can now be used to speak praise. That could be used to tell a lie can now be used to tell the truth. And the money that could be spent on Things that are vile and profane and that are sinful will now be used for that which is good and right and the will of God. So whatever I have in my possession is now to be taken and used by the Lord, not by Satan. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. 
Well, you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom ye you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, verse 16 is the proof of what I said earlier. It's not what you claim. It's how you live that decides whether or not you're alive unto Christ and dead unto sin or alive unto sin and dead unto Christ. And it's not what you claim, and by the way, might I interject, it's not just being in a church building on Sunday morning, that proves that you're a servant of God. I know some people who never miss a service of the church. And they don't even claim to be Christians. But they're always there. So being in the church building, faithfully doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian? What's the proof? It's who you're serving. So with your life, with your time, with your money, with your energy, whose will are you doing? Are you doing the will of Satan? Or are you doing the will of God? Paul said, the one whose will you're doing is the one whose slave you are. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but or yet you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which, delivered, which was delivered you and being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your member servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, that is just one sin leads to another, so to speak, even so now yield your member servants to righteousness unto holiness. And get the power of verses 20 through 23, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit, that is, what result, had you then in those things? Things that you're now ashamed of. And right here in this audience this morning, there are some of us who look back over our lives and know that we did certain things that we are so ashamed of. What would have been the result if we'd have stayed right there in those things? Last word of verse 21 death verse 22 is a verse of rejoicing but now being made free from sin and become servants to God you have your fruit the result the difference in the outcome in your life now unto holiness and what's the end of that verse 22 everlasting life For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I have an unpleasant task when I stand here this morning to tell you the whole truth about that if you're practicing sin. Because I can tell you for a fact, I must tell you for a fact, I'm compelled by the love of God to tell you for a fact that if you are practicing evil in your life and you don't repent and you continue doing that, you're not only going to die physically, but you're going to die eternally in the fires that are called hell. But I have a most pleasant task. I can tell you that in the blood of Christ, there's forgiveness. And it doesn't matter what your sins are, how many they are, or how, how many years you've been committing them. 
I can tell you that every one of those sins can be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus his Lord, our Lord rather, his Son. But you have a choice. You have a decision to make. So not just while you're here in this auditorium, but what are you going to do tomorrow? And how are you going to talk? And what kind of things are you going to do with people? And where are you going to go? And what, what will you spend your money on? What will characterize your life? It's all in your power. God's will is for you while here on earth to use your time, your life, your energy, your talents, all of your life with one goal, to do what is right and to say no to that which is wrong. Open your songbooks, please, to the number announced. Speech on. Stream and track and back button. 30 playback or buffer position. 35, 09, 100 battery power. Charging. Status. Screen recording in progress. 1201 button. 35, 0 buffer. Search streams button. Previous item button. Stop. Next up. Unpause. Help and feed. Share your book volume. 69%. Adjustable. Cellular. 2. Control center. Calculator. Timer. Button. Selected. Music. Selected. Screen recording. 